Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Freedom Church. Uh, welcome if you're watching online. Um, this just came to me this week when uh, I was thinking about people watching it at home, and often when I'm at home watching it, I'll tend to just sit and watch it. So if you're at home now, I just uh, if you're able to, why don't you stand with us and and just close your eyes and as if you were here this morning. So why don't we all stand? And we'll begin our time of worship now.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me Let's sing Jesus Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. This week, um, preparing for this next song, uh, <clears throat> this just popped up on the on the Bible app on the phone, and it says sometimes 
it's hard to praise God. Sometimes God feels distant. Sometimes we don't feel God's goodness at all, yet. When we take a moment to truly pause and dwell in his presence, we realize that he is always worthy of praise, always present and always good. Say again, we realize that he is always worthy of praise, always present and always good. Let's sing the goodness of God.
when things are going well to trust in God, right? But the, um, the only times where trust really takes traction is when things are difficult. Like, and it's, it's great to sing about the faithfulness of God when things are going well, but the faithfulness of God is our song when we struggle. And I just want to take a moment, just want to ask you to close your eyes and as we continue in this sort of moment of worship, just whatever's going on, I just want you to find in your mind a, an item of gratitude, thankfulness for the faithfulness of God. Because I have no doubt whatever you're going through, there are things that God has been doing and you can see his faithfulness in your life. Let's, and let's begin to just thank him. Let's begin to thank him for those things. If you want to if you want to do that now in, in, in words, then begin to thank God. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, despite these other things that are happening, I thank for your faithfulness that you are the solid foundation. Lord, that we can trust in you. Lord, that you are eternally with us. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. In the darkest of moments, thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you pursue us. Even when we're running away, you pursue us. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that you're faithful even when we're not faithful. Thank you, Lord, that you're with us. And thank you that you're with us now, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, team, for leading us. We're so grateful to you guys for all that you do. Love that. Welcome, guys. Welcome to Freedom Church. Welcome online. If you're online, I hope you are standing and, and getting stuck into worship. We want to welcome you here today. Is everyone all right? Groovy. Um, <clears throat> we're looking forward to um, hosting uh, what we call a sort of newcomer's lunch, okay, which basically means... If you've not been to one of those before, we're going to have lunch after the service here on the 2nd of April. You'll, you'll have an opportunity to uh, connect in with some of the team, uh, to find out a bit more about Freedom Church. Also, maybe to tell us a bit more about who you are. We love to hear um, what you carry, what your heart is. And um, if you feel like uh, you want to sort of scope out Freedom a bit more, please feel free uh, to come to the newcomers' lunch, we'd love to welcome you, and we will eat some yummy food as well, which um, I'm sure everyone looks forward to after the, the service on a Sunday. Uh, I definitely do. Um, so we'd love to welcome you to that, guys. Um, also, I just want to um, raise the, the possibility again for anyone who's here who considers themselves uh, part of Freedom Church and wants to make a contribution financially, just so that you know um, all the details are available for you. I'm not sure if they're coming up on screen. I'm not sure if they are. But there are multiple different ways how you can get involved. And um, we just want to say as well how grateful we are to all those who are involved. As you can see uh, in this auditorium, things are emerging and changing. This morning, we have the pleasure of getting a suntan as well as being in the auditorium. You can see the new lights are in, all the trusses up. And we are... Um, chipping away. When I say we, I mean Andrew and the team chipping away. Um, so thank you. Um, it's the royal we on this occasion. Um, so they're chipping away at all the final things that need to be done in this space. And we're so grateful. It's good, isn't it? It's good. And so we're so grateful to God in, in the midst of this journey that these things are, are also coming to, a, coming to a close. Keep praying for us, please, as we uh, take the next steps uh, with the auditorium. And get involved. Like, 
get involved. We're not asking you to do th anything out of compulsion. Really what we ask is that people are prayerful and consider how they can be part of the community in that way. So if you can commit to that, we're happy with that. Let God do the rest. No pressure. Okay? So thank you. Um, kids, you are awesome and we love you. Uh, I used to do this thing where um, I would get you to stand on your chairs. I don't know if you fancy doing that right now. It's a health and safety risk. You're welcome to Freedom Chair. No, I'm joking. Um, please, kids, stand on your chair or your significant adult. Um, and then <laughs> I always love... I always love an ear-bleeding response. That means that it's so loud that it like makes you stand up and listen. So if you are, and any teenagers who stand on their chair right now get utter kudos from me. Well done. Yeah, well done. So if you're a teenager and you want to stand on your chair. So in a moment, we're going we're gonna to release you to go and study about Jesus and get into God together. And we're going to pray for you right now. And then I want you to say amen, but I want to hear it. Are you in? Are you in, yeah? Good, because otherwise I'm going to look like a, a right muppet. All right, so I, I want you to be in. Are you ready? Father, we pray your blessing on this generation. Lord, we pray your blessing. And as these guys stand as part of the church, we pray your blessing on their generation. That they be a generation that know you, that love you, that step into your purposes for their lives, that see through the things of the world to what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Guys, have a, have a brilliant time. Be blessed. And um, if, you, if you're not taking kids out, and you've got the opportunity to say hi to someone in the room, maybe even someone you don't know. Who'd have thought? Um, go for it and cross that boundary. Okay, no scary hugs.
Good morning, everyone. Why don't you have a seat? Some good conversation in the room. It's what we love. A couple of people are still coming back in from dropping the kids off. Everybody good, settled, ready for the word of God. Lent started this week. I mentioned it last Sunday as well. Traditional time in the Christian calendar where we get to stop and pause and reflect on ourselves, on our faith, but crucially as well, on Jesus' work for us at the cross. And so I think it's a timely moment to cover what I'm going to be talking about today. You see, if you've been with us on this journey for the past few weeks, you'll know that our theme at the moment is the story of God. We've got this overarching vision statement, which is flourishing for the people of Jersey, and we're presenting that by starting right at the beginning of creation and working through God's story so that we can find our place within it and hopefully find practical grounding so we can say, okay, I get it. This is where God's story has come from. This is where I'm in it. And this, I know, is where it's going. That's the idea. And we've been using this idea of a five-act play. And hopefully we've got a screen um, which has come up behind, and it comes from the theologian N.C. Wright, who articulates it beautifully. These five acts of Scripture, creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, and then the church. And we live in Act 5, but we cannot understand Act 5 unless we have covered Acts 1 to 4, to really ground ourselves in that. So the last two weeks, Tim and then Phil have been covering Act 1, creation. There's a lot that I've taken away from what they've said. A lot of challenges. It's been a picture stunningly presented of a God who created a perfect harmonious world and then created us, humanity, in his image. And one of the greatest challenges that I took away, particularly from Phil's preach last week, was he put up a picture of his dog, Henry, praying for another dog. And in that moment, I felt convicted because we have two cats and they've never prayed for anything. <laughs> but, as with all, um, you know, when you hear the word, you go away, right? And you do something about it when you're challenged. So, Kelsey and I spent this week preaching the word of the Lord to our cats, sharing with them the goodness of God. And finally, on Friday, after a week of praying and preaching, Lola, our girl cat, laid hands on Lion and prayed for him. Now, Lion was asleep um, and didn't really sort of, I think, receive it. But nonetheless, when we hear preaching in this church, we put it into practice. Exhibit A. Um, now, funny how the preaching roster sort of works itself out, but um, luckily, somehow, I get to talk about the fall. And so today, our subject, our title, and hopefully we've got a screen for this, is we are going to talk about the S word, sin. As I started studying this, I was a bit apprehensive coming 
to it as a topic, as you can probably imagine. But the more I've started to pray over it and research it, this has grabbed me this week. It really has. It's captured me to the extent that I feel like I don't have enough time today to do full justice to what the importance of understanding sin is. And we may well come back to it later in the year for um, two or three more weeks. Because I think I myself had forgotten that until you put sin in its right place in God's story, nothing else makes full sense. In fact, without sin, we cannot ever understand the impact of Jesus' death. We can't answer the big questions of our worldview. Who are we? Why are we here? What's going on? In our culture today, sin is an offensive doctrine. And yet everyone seemingly acknowledges its existence. We all look around. We know that things are not perfect. We perceive evil. We see evil. And in many ways and at many times, we, experiencing our, we experience ourselves living and thinking and acting in a way that even we don't like. There is an acknowledgement in our culture that sin exists, but a refusal to do any deep work on it. To ask the tough questions as to what's going on here? And I want to ask that question today. And I believe, and I'm just going to pray now, that as we talk about sin, the extraordinary grace of Jesus and the power of his work on the cross is going to, I don't know the best way to put it, to land in this room like it has never landed before. Whether you've been a Christian for a day or for 15 years, we can never become familiar with the cross of Christ. And if we do not look sin in the face, sometimes that's very easy to do. So Heavenly Father, well, we know this topic can stir a lot of things. But Jesus, we're looking at sin today in the light of your cross. We know that this is only act two in the story, and God ground us in that today, Lord. As we speak about sin, I pray that your love and your forgiveness and your light would shine through in our lives in an immensely powerful and impactful way. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Fleming Rutledge, a theologian, she said, it is only by endeavoring to look sin straight in the face that we are able to understand grace. Now, I'm a rugby fan, and in 2008, the All Blacks, the New Zealand All Blacks, played Wales. And it was in the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff. And at the beginning of every game that New Zealand play, they do the hacker, which is essentially a war dance, very culturally significant, and done before every single rugby game they play. If you've ever watched New Zealand play, you'll know exactly what I mean. Now in this game in 2008, New Zealand did the hacker like they always do, but this time the Welsh players did something slightly different. They stood next to each other on the halfway line and they just stared down the hacker. And the hacker ended and the New Zealand players stood up and stared back at the Welsh. And there is this, you can look it up on YouTube, you hear the cauldron of the crowd get louder and louder as they, they see what's happening. And there is just this stare off, 15 guys, 15 guys, and they're just looking at each other dead in the eyes. And the referee starts like going down the middle like this. He's trying to like break it. And they won't. They're staring each other down. And I remember that was 2008. I remember having this weird moment, probably nearly a decade later, just under, six or seven years ago now, where I was contemplating the idea of sin. I think I'd read a scripture on it. I was wrestling with it. And God brought that image back into my mind. And he said to me, similar to that Fleming Rutledge quote, you need to learn to stare sin in the face rather than brushing it under the carpet Rather than pretending it doesn't exist, 
rather than justifying yourself and being like, ah, this will be fine. Stare sin in the face and stare it down because as you stare down sin in the face, you will realize the power of Christ's victory that is in you and that will flow through you. And that was a bit of a change for me. It was a bit of a change in attitude towards sin because I I suddenly realized, actually, the more I grapple with what sin is, the more I'm going to understand who Jesus is. It's one of those secret keys. And I promise you, if you want to go deeper in your spiritual life, in understanding who Jesus is, at some point you have to look sin in the face. But it's not a journey that ends in condemnation. It's a journey that ends in victory. Genesis 3 is where we've got to in our big story of God. And this is the moment in Scripture where the entrance of sin into God's perfect world is described. We read it in Genesis 3, 1 to 8. We realize that there is a serpent in the garden, the Garden of Eden, and the scripture says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired, was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, It was the serpent. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And in this moment, all the fingerprints of sin's work are on show. Deception, lies, disobedience, shame, blame, and you could not have a more stark contrast from what Phil and Tim preached about the last two weeks to this moment right here in Scripture. Perfection has been shattered, and in an instant, the beauty of creation has been seemingly irreversibly corrupted. Two analogies to maybe think of. Imagine a potter taking great time and effort creating a beautiful vase. And then in an instant, someone comes in and knocks the vase off the stand and it shatters into a million pieces on the floor. Another analogy I read this week, imagine an art gallery filled with priceless and beautiful works of art that someone comes in and slashes the artwork, puts it on the floor, tramples on it, spray paints it, with paint and vandalizes the work. Two examples of something broken that was beautiful, shattered and unable to be put back to its original state. That is the essence of what sin caused in Scripture. And it's a powerful and important message, although this might be in these poetic terms of Genesis. It is something that influences and impacts each and every one of us today. Humanity had been lured by a force that was adverse to God's will, who questioned, by the way, the validity and authority 
of God's word said, did God actually say? Is that not exactly what the enemy still tries to do today? Questioning the validity and authority of God's word. And then humanity, in humanity's pride, in that moment, thought to themselves, I can do this. I want to eat this fruit. I want to be like God. A picture of sin is painted in this moment, and it's one that is worth thinking about. This is what is known as the fall, the fall of humanity. Now, often when people hear the word sin, they go one of two ways with it. And I wonder whether either of these was your instinctive reaction when you realized I was going to talk about sin this morning. The first direction people take sin is to just moralize it and to narrow its definition, basically to make sin all about doing either what's right or what's wrong. Sin, therefore, is all to do with failure and punishment. It's narrowed down to a list of things to do or not to do. That's what sin is. When sin is moralized, it is often then used as a stick to beat people with. You did that wrong. You failed at that. I'm going to suggest that we're missing the point if we simply condense sin to our moral behavior. The other extreme that people take sin to is to say sin is no big deal whatsoever. In fact, that's the culture that we live in now. We don't like talking about sin. In fact, because we don't like talking about it, we've trivialized sin. We've domesticated it. We've tamed it. We say things like, that dessert was sinful. We speak of little white lies. I believe, in fact, there is a uh, cafe called The Sinful Vegan in Jersey. Am I right? I mean, that, that is a big deal. We say things like, my bad, with a smile on our face. That's the other extreme of sin, that we ignore it and sweep it under the carpet and pretend that everything's fine, even though we know instinctively it's not. The trouble with these two extremes is that they cause two different responses. If we see sin entirely as doing stuff wrong, we spend our whole life trying to treat the act of sin and we never try to get to the root cause of sin. We misdiagnose the condition and consequently prescribe the wrong antidotes. In the other direction, when we ignore sin and pretend it doesn't exist, well, in ourselves at least, we're still often happy to point it out in others. We push it down. The trouble is, we discover that it never goes away. As we try to ignore things that we may or may not be doing wrong or attitudes that we have, the deeper we go, it just never seems to disappear. And that should make us question something, right? Last week, Phil put two creation stories in front of us. The Babylonian creation story, where the world was created through violence and two gods fighting each other, and one swiping another one in half and making the heavens and the earth out of this gruesome, bloody battle. And then the creation story of Genesis, of a good God creating a perfect world. Now, if the Babylonian story was correct, if this world was created in and through violence and destruction, we should not be surprised by the state of this world. In fact, violence, doing things badly, should never make us feel guilty. If that's how the world was created, that's how we should live in existence, right? And yet all of us have something in us that instinctively seems to know that something's not right. It's why we feel guilt and shame, because we feel that we've lived or acted in a way that seems to contravene some standard we quite, can't quite put our finger on. So pushing sin under the carpet never works. We end up numbing ourselves to reality as the only way to deal with something that we know to be wrong or out of sync with how things should be. 
So today, as we look sin squarely in the face, I want to blow the box open. And I want to help deal with this tension and lead us all to Jesus. You see, sin is described in the ESV study Bible as anything, whether in thoughts, actions, or attitudes that does not express or conform to the holy character of God as expressed in his moral law. I want to make sure that we don't desensitize ourselves from this because the fall is such a fundamental act in the five-act play that explains where everything goes from that point onwards. And I want to reframe it in, the ter- in terms of a second S word, which I think has helped me this week and I hope will help you as well. Realize the depths of what sin caused and equally then the power of what Jesus did. And I think we've got a second S word slide. And this is the, um, this is the S word I want you to take home with you today. It's shalom. Shalom. Phil used this word a couple of times last week. Loosely, it translates as peace. But it's actually a whole lot deeper than that. Shalom is a Hebrew word that describes the totality of God's wholeness and harmony. It speaks of flourishing and delight. Our tagline, flourishing for the people of Jersey, if we'd gone even geekier with it, we could have gone with shalom for the people of Jersey. Because shalom is the very essence of God. The whole creation narrative that we've read in the last two weeks speaks of shalom, its beauty, its goodness, its intimacy with God. Now, as humans, shalom looks like this. It looks like right relationship in four different directions. Shalom involves harmony with God, harmony with ourselves, harmony with others, and harmony with the world around us. That's what Genesis has set up in Genesis 1 and 2. Humanity had a perfect relationship with God, a perfect relationship with one another. They didn't feel shame. They didn't feel guilt. They had a perfect relationship with themselves, and they were stewards or had dominion over the world around them. That is the four core relationships, and you can see there. I will just get out of the way for a moment. This is the essence of shalom, right relationship, harmony, beauty in every direction, 360 degree peace. Does that make sense? Now, with that picture in mind, as Adam and Eve broke God's one rule, it wasn't just about them doing something wrong. In that moment, they shattered God's shalom. You see, sin at its core is not just doing bad stuff. Sin is the anti-shalom. It's anti-flourishing. It's anti-God's path, and it's anti-fellowship with God. It's the very power that creates a world that is less than God's ideal and perfection. It's the thing that disrupts and destroys God's beautiful world that he wanted us to flourish in. And so as sin entered the world, our four key relationships of shalom were shattered. With God, you see it in our passage today, right? God continued to pursue humanity, but humanity ran to hide from God. It was an acknowledgement that this separation was man's own doing. The imaging of God that was so beautiful in Genesis 1 and 2 had been disrupted. Suddenly, you've got humanity blaming one another, hiding, feeling shame. A couple of chapters later, you've got Cain and Abel. You've got murder enters the scene. The relationship with God that was so clear and beautiful and two-way was suddenly blocked, separated. It's as if Imagine like a long cardboard tube and humanity could see God perfectly through that tube and God looked at humanity straight through. So imagine that that tube was suddenly blocked up with tissue paper or whatever. The relationship was broken. 
sin damaged the relationship with ourselves. It caused shame. It taught us to hide from God. It hardened our hearts as we numb ourselves trying to deal with this broken relationship. The trouble is, as sin breaks our relationship with ourself, we actually become less human in the whole process. We become less and less ourselves. We do violence against our hearts, our emotions, our minds, and our bodies. It's a distinctive identity change where shalom involved that perfect relationship with ourselves. Sin is the thing that constantly puts us at war against ourselves. And in order to try and deal with that, we try to make ourselves God. In order to deal with this pain that we feel inside that we do not know how to deal with. Sin alienates us from others. I've seen sin described as love turned in on itself. Love turned in on itself. You see, when the self becomes God, everyone around us loses value because we are now the new highest authority in our life. And so our relationship starts to fracture and break with people around us. They let us down, we let them down. And of course, the world. We were designed, as Tim beautifully put it in our first week, to rule and reign on this world as God's stewards. And yet sin causes us to give up that rule and to hand it over to the enemy, or as he's described in the New Testament, the prince of this earth, Satan. Do you see that sin is much bigger than just, oh, I've done that wrong, or I've thought a bad thought? Sin is the destruction of our entire worldview. The more we think about this broken shalom, the more we realize as well that it's almost contagious, that we're stuck in cycles and systems and patterns that we cannot free ourselves from. You see, we know this, and all of you will know this from experience. This lack of shalom, sin, it hurts you, the sinner, as you sin. It causes consequences in your own life. But it doesn't just hurt you. We don't live in a vacuum. Sin hurts those around us. We let others down. We disappoint them. Not only that, it's not just a two-person thing, but actually this lack of shalom has a compounding effect. Think of it like this. Your boss at work snaps at you because he's having a bad day. You then feel awful. You're annoyed at your boss. And you, someone you work with, you end up snapping at them later in the day because you were frustrated because your boss snapped at you. They go home and snap at their partner because they've had an annoying day at work. The partner snaps at the kid. The kid, I don't know, snaps at the dog. But we know how this works, right? This anti-shalom has a ripple effect. It doesn't just stay where it is. It starts causing systems and patterns and institutions where anti-shalom is running riot on this planet. And the reason that I'm bigging this up so much is because I just want it to land this morning again that this is a big deal and it's a problem. We live in a world where anti-shalom runs riot. In Genesis 4, sin is talked about like a lion crouching at your door. It's a predator. It's a captor. It tries to bind people up. When shalom was lost at the fall, everything changed. And this is why Act 2 is so important. It teaches us that sin is not just an action, it is the condition of our heart now. It's the nature we're born into, not through fault of our own, but then we continue in that nature. This isn't a momentary thing. This isn't the time where you'd be like, oh, these are all the things I've done in my life that weren't good. It's realizing, firstly, that because of this anti-shalom that exists on this planet, we are all born into this space. We are the shattered pottery that has no hope of putting itself back together. We are the corrupted artwork that cannot be restored. It's so easy to see evil everywhere else, but to not see it in our own lives 
the philosopher, and I'm going to pronounce this badly, so apologize, Alexander Sol Solzhenitsyn. That's right. Wrote this, and it's always struck me. The line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. The line shifts inside us, it oscillates with the years, and even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And in that, the philosopher captures this essence of the image of God corrupted, right? He's saying that in everyone there is good because there are these hints of the image that we were all born into. But equally in each of us, there is this anti-shalom, this sin. We struggle with these corrupted natures. And it's why the Bible says we're in such a mess. It's an explanation of the evil that we see. It's an explanation of why we do the things we do not want to do and don't do the things that we do want to do. We need, here it is, a savior. The only one who can rescue and restore this situation, this nature, this condition of anti-shalom, of sin, is the very potter or artist himself. And this is why Jesus had to come. And this is why Jesus had to die. The only solution to this destruction, this pattern of destruction, was a brutal death that would show us and teach us that anti-shalom is a huge deal. It's not fixable by ourself. And the cost of fixing it is huge. And so, as the gospel message goes, Jesus became the one who was beaten, spit on, mocked, rejected, tortured, impaled, all physically in his body in order to take our place and to take on his shoulders everything that we have done to ourselves and to others. Isaiah 53 said, says, surely he has borne our griefs and he has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. Shalom. With his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. And so my final slide, if it hasn't come up yet, is how the cross is our restoration of shalom in all four directions. You see, we cannot throw sin under the rug. We cannot pretend that our sin does not have real life consequences because it does. We've all experienced it ourselves and we've caused it in others. We cannot minimize sin because every single sin was the reason that Jesus died. This five-act play is not about getting caught in act two and condemning ourselves consistently for sin. It's acknowledging that sin exists. It's acknowledging that it's a big deal. And it's openly proclaiming and declaring that the only answer is Jesus Christ. That is where sin has to lead us, but you can't get there. You can't get to Jesus without going through Act 2. Tim Keller says, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet, at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. That is the gospel. If we go out of here and one of you falls over and grazes your elbow, 
and I come and give you a plaster, you'll probably say thank you to me and think nothing of it, right? You'll be like, oh, Ben had a plaster. He gave me a plaster. Cheers. If you go out of here and get hit by a car, and one of the surgeons in Jersey stays up for 48 hours straight to save your life and keep you alive, how much more grateful will you be to that surgeon than you would have been to me for giving you a plaster? Until you realize the depths of the injury, you cannot understand or have gratitude for the one who has saved you. If you see sin like a grazed elbow, you will only thank Jesus for giving you a plaster. If you realize that sin, even more than just putting you within an inch of your life, if you realize that sin has killed you spiritually, then your gratitude to Jesus for raising you from the dead will be more than you can ever imagine. As Jesus died, the perfect second Adam he took back authority. He restored the image of God within us. The old life has gone. The new life has come. He established his kingdom and he rose victorious. This is God's renewal. This is God's restoration that we are all called to carry. It is the restoration of shalom and then the carrying of that same shalom to a world that is broken, flourishing, for the people of Jersey. So as we finish, you might be thinking, what's our part? How do I make that connection? How do I experience the depths of this restoration of shalom that Jesus offers each and every one of us? And it's this big word, sometimes scary word, but I want to suggest beautiful word, repentance. You see, repentance is not beating yourself up. Repentance is not living in shame. The word um, repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. It involves returning to the path and saying, you know what? I want to come back to Jesus. He is my restorer of shalom. And this is where I wanted to lead to today, because we're going to have a moment of repentance now, and we're going to do it through the historical and traditional method of remembering Jesus' death and resurrection that he himself taught us, and that's communion. Communion has value at so many different levels. It's sharing with one another across the table. It's unity as the body of Christ, but it's also a powerful moment of repentance and restoration as we take the body of Christ that was broken for us and the blood of Christ that was shed for us for the restoration of our shalom. So I'm going to ask um, maybe Alice or if Alice is on keys to come back and just um, start playing and I'm going to pray um, and then for the rest of the worship team, you guys can get communion for yourself. But this is how we're ending the, the service today. We've got three stations all around the room. The band will then start playing and worshipping. And I just want you to take the bread, take the wine, take it back to your seat. And in a moment of repentance... Firstly, just for a moment, diagnose and confess if there's stuff going on in your life, in your head, in your heart that you just know. You're like, God, this is, this is not of you. This is not who I want to be. Just call it out in your own head. Don't sweep it under the rug. Call it out. Like I say, the power of Christ's grace comes through staring sin in the face. Just stare at it and say, I see it. And then as you take the bread and you take the wine, in that moment, you are laying all of that sin on Jesus' shoulders. It's coming off you and it's going on him. That's what the cross was. It's what the cross achieved. 
Jesus was broken so shalom could be restored in your life, that peace. And that moment of repentance can quickly turn to a moment of joy, a moment of relief, a moment of freedom, as you realize that that's the power of this message. You can experience grace in full. You see, when Jesus preached repentance, it was because the kingdom of heaven had come close. And that's what I'm believing in this moment now, as you take this moment to repent and acknowledge and then see the cross for what it is. God has come close to us and repentance is about joyfully and intentionally adjusting our lives back to this reality. What was started at the fall was finished at the cross and we'll be continuing to unpack that over the next few weeks. But I'm going to pray and then feel free to get your communion and just have a moment with God and then we'll end with worship. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's never easy to look at sin in the face. Lord, it, our immediate reaction is so often shame and regret and condemnation. But that's not why you call us to look at sin in the face. You call us to look at it, to know that it's been beaten. It has been conquered. It has been broken in our lives. And the lack of shalom that just defines so much of what we see and what we experience has been restored at the cross. And God, as we take communion as a community now, Lord, we just pray that your spirit would work powerfully in this place, Lord. Set people free. Jesus, in your grace, shame cannot continue to exist. I feel like there are some people in here that as you get the communion, you just need to say to yourself over and over again, until it lands, Christ forgives me. Christ forgives me. Christ forgives me. Holy Spirit, just work, work in power, work in freedom in this moment. In Jesus' name. Amen. There's three stations. Feel free to start getting communion. And let's just stay in this moment now for a few more minutes before we end the service.
you'd like to stand one last time, everybody? Sing together. the name 
I want to just leave you with one thing, and that is on the 24th of March, on Friday evening, the 24th of March, we're going to meet here for a time of worship, a time of prayer ministry, and and just an opportunity to get into God, there'll be some prayer involved, there'll be a time where we're just in the presence of God together. Now, there's been a lot of sort of build up to why that we're doing this. We're calling it the filling station. And it's an opportunity for you to come, have a bit more time, a bit less restriction, be in the presence of God for there to be worship and for you to receive from him. Um, So please put that in your diary on the 24th of March. Other than that, guys, have a great week and go from here knowing that the qualification is recognition that you need Jesus. Okay, have a great week. God bless you. Grab a coffee. Say hi to someone maybe afterwards. If you see anyone stood on their own, go and say hi to them unless they tell you to go away, okay? Then leave them alone. Oh, the chairs need to go away. Bless you. You get an opportunity to serve. Um, So the the blue ones go on top of each other, 15 high, and the grey ones go away on the thing. uh, And there's, yeah, go for it.